Thank you very much for joining us at this webinar, the second in a series of three webinars with Allianz Global Investors. I'm Rupert Hargreaves, the Deputy Digital Editor here at Money Week, and today I'm talking with Simon Gergel, the Portfolio Manager for the Merchant Trust, which manages assets worth £934 million. It's a UK-focused income trust with 95% of assets invested in UK equities and the remainder in Europe. Last year, the trust was one of the few to beat the market, with the value of its assets rising 10.5% for the 12 months to the end of November, compared to a return of 6.5% for its benchmark, the FTSE All Share Index. Over the six months to the end of April, the trust's net asset value has increased 14.1%, compared to 12.5% for its benchmark. Today, the trust trades at a slight premium to NAV and yields just under 5%. So welcome, Simon. Hi, Rupert. Good to be here. So the first place I want to start then is seeing as the mer Merchants is a UK focus trust, is just to get your views on the London equity market and this whole idea that the UK is an equity backwater, that no one's interested in investing here, that all the companies are going to disappear and move to the US. What are your views on that and where are you seeing opportunities in the market today? Well, it's a great question to start with. I mean, we have seen over a number of years persistent selling by large institutions in the UK. So big pension funds and insurance companies have gone from owning about 50% of the market 20 or 30 years ago to owning about 5% today. And we've actually seen retail investors selling as well. Um, but I tend to see that as a glass half full rather than glass half empty. A lot of that selling pressure is now gone out of the way. Um, and actually, there's there aren't many sort of large shareholders left to sell who are not interested in the market. And what's left is the it means the market is actually quite cheap. Um, the UK market is one of the cheapest markets in the world. It's trading well below its long-term average and well below other markets. And within the UK stock market, you've got a, a, a large range of different types of businesses. Some are genuinely global multinational businesses um, you know, with strong positions in other markets. Uh, many others are more domestic. Uh, market com companies focused on the UK, and there's lots of really interesting opportunities. So, I think it's it's a it's a fascinating market. It's a cheap market. It's highly polarised as well. We might want to talk about that. The gap between highly rated and lowly rated companies is very wide as well. So, as a stock picker, it's full of opportunities at the moment. Yeah. So that's uh, we'll dig into that a bit in, in Merchant's portfolio. I think so. Your top holdings are GSK and Shell. Um, and they, you're, you're under, slightly underweight those compared to the index, if I'm correct there. We, we're actually overweight in Glaxo GSK. We like, we like that company. We, we, we like Shell as well, but we are underweight because it's such a large part of the, of the benchmark. Yeah. How would you look at then, I know it's, you're, you're underweighted, but in terms of the overall picture of Shell compared to its US and, in, and UK peers, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you look at the company? Do you think it's just quite significantly undervalued? Do you think, is this representative of what's happening in the UK market? Partly. So Shell and BP, to some extent, trade almost a 50% discount to the US major oil and gas companies. Um, and if any, you know, they're, they're, they're very strong businesses. They're generating uh, high returns, huge amounts of cash, and they have transition strategies to gradually refocus the business away from fossil fuels, from hydrocarbons, towards uh, renewable power, towards alternatives over time. Um, and I think they are strong businesses that you know, justify uh, or potentially justify a, a large investment in the, in the, in the fund. So yeah, I think we, we do see them as to some extent an example of undervaluation of the UK versus other markets. Uh, and, and these are global businesses, I mean, they're, Yes, they have a large presence in the UK, but the vast majority of their assets and earnings comes from, comes from abroad. And is, is that the same with GSK? I mean, this is a global company that's really been unloved for a very long time, even when it broke itself apart. Absolutely. I mean, most pharmaceutical companies make most of their money in North America and the United States, which is the most profitable region. And GSK is no different. It's got a fantastic vaccines business as well, which uh, is one of the world leaders in vaccines and seeing some quite strong growth. Um, so, yes, it's, a, it's also a global business that looks undervalued, although quite a few pharmaceutical companies globally are quite modestly priced at the moment. It's not alone in that, but it does stand out a bit. Do you see them 
I mean, we've talked about how the UK market is undervalued, but both these companies are income champions as well. So could you talk about how, how basically how these companies fit into your income strategy and, and what your growth, your idea of growth is for income from them over the next couple of years? Yes, I mean, probably worth taking a step back and how we think about income. So we, we are trying, we are value investors. We're trying to buy companies that we think can deliver a good return, a good total return, but we're also trying to del deliver income. But we don't let the income drive the investment decision. So we, we try to buy companies with a good yield, but the, the buy or sell decision is always driven by, do we think we're going to make money? Do we think we can make a good total return out of this company? And we won't buy a company just because it's got a good yield. And that's a really important distinction. Um, and that helps us to try and avoid companies that might be value traps, companies with a high dividend yield that might actually not deliver a good, good total return. So yes, both GSK and particularly Shell have, have good dividend yields um, and have opportunities to grow those dividends over time. Um, but that's not necessarily the main reason why we're buying them. We're buying them because we think they can both generate uh, good, good total returns. So how about... Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to, sorry. So on the income story, I mean, Merchants Trust, we have, we pay a high dividend, as you said at the beginning, high dividend yield. That dividend has grown for 41 years in a row. It's a, it's a key objective of the board of the company to try to grow the dividend every year. So how, in, in keeping that investment strategy in mind, where you're looking for value first and then income second, um, could you talk about your biggest active weights in the portfolio, which are DCC and IG, and maybe just give give people an idea of how you came across them in the first place and the investment analysis process behind them. Yeah, well, DCC is a distribution company. It, it does um, activities from distributing um, fuel to people off off the off the uh, off the grid. So, think about liquid petroleum, gas. Think about um, oil to oil cylinders, um, but it also distributes pharmaceutical products uh, and different healthcare products. It distributes technology products in different markets. And it, it's, its strategy is to consolidate fragmented distribution markets, build scale, build efficiencies, um, and grow profitability. And it's got a fantastic long-term record of achieving that, of, of delivering growth in, in revenue, in profits, in cash, um, and consolidating these fragmented markets and then sometimes selling on those assets. Um, it came to us as an idea actually originally from some of our colleagues who, who are more of the growth investors in this company because it's got a great long-term growth record, it was quite popular with some of our more growth oriented colleagues. But over time, the business has derated, de devalued and got cheaper and cheaper and started to pay quite an attractive dividend yield and, and uh, has looked good value to us, uh, but yet still delivering decent growth. So we see it as a combination of offering good underlying growth, uh, the ability to to keep consolidating fragmented markets, but also paying a nice dividend, which has again grown quite consistently. Um, so that that's the type of company we like to see. Um, IG is very different. IG is a company we've owned for many years. Um, it again has a really good long-term growth record. It, for those who don't know, it provides the ability for individuals to um, invest in all sorts of financial assets um, around the world, whether that's indices, commodities, equities, um, and its customer base is semi-professional. I mean, these are fairly wealthy people typically who spend a lot of their time trading, uh, quite sophisticated. And IG has excellent long-term growth record, has a really strong balance sheet, lots of cash, cash on the balance sheet, um, and makes very high profit margins, high returns on capital, um, and yet is very modestly priced for a number of reasons. Um, and that means that we see really good value or have seen good value in the company. Um, and again, it pays a, a nice dividend yield. And um, you know, what we like to, ideally, what both of these examples where they're similar is we think they're both strong companies making good returns with decent gross prospects on modest valuations. And that's really the ideal, um, the ideal thing we look for. So what, what exact sort of qualities would you look for with both of them? What are some key metrics you'd use to analyze the dividend and dividend sustainability here? Um, well, it's less about the dividend and dividend sustainability. It's about three. We, we look for three things in companies. Um, the first is the fundamentals. We look for businesses that are fundamentally strong. So attract strong market positions, attractive industries, um, 
good corporate governance. We want to understand environmental, social, and governance risks. We want, want to build a picture to say this is fundamentally a strong business. The second thing is valuation. Now, yield, yield, dividend yield is part of that valuation, but much more important is actually how much cash they generate, how much free cash flow this business can generate, which will allow them to pay dividends, but also to invest in growth over time. And we want to buy companies below what we think they're fundamentally worth. So we want good businesses that are cheap. And then the third thing we look for is what we call themes, which is what are the external drivers? What are the, the um, if you like, the thematic drivers of this indus industry? So if you take IG Group, uh, digital trends allow people to trade assets uh, more frequently wherever they are, whether they're at home, in the office, on the bus, um, and they can trade a, a vast range of products, so proliferation of products. And also people are taking more control of their own investments these days. We move from a world where people typically looked after your money for you, whether that's pension funds or insurance companies, to one where typically people have to look after their money themselves. So all of those long-term trends are, help, are playing towards IG. So it's a combination of good business that's trading below what we think it's fundamentally worth with these external drivers that are driving the industry forward over time. And that's a really good combination. So dividend is not really the key driver of that, as you can tell. Uh, it's about you know, companies that meet those other three criteria. So I, on, on coming up, just coming off the back of that, one thing that's got me thinking of another long-term trend is it's disruption. And we're seeing the pace of disruption really accelerate. Mm -hmm. uh, with a company like IG and, well, to a certain extent, all of the companies we've discussed so far, how would you look at disruption and weigh the pros and cons and risks of disruption to a business model compared to what's, what it is today compared to what could happen over the coming years? It's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so we, we sort of lump that into what we call themes. So we try to understand the, the threats to businesses and the opportunities. So disruption can be a massive threat to some companies. It can be an opportunity if you are the disruptor. And we spend a lot of our time, and that's really where a lot of the analysis and this debate goes on, is, is how strong are these disruptive trends? What's happening in regulation? What's happening on digitalization? What's happening in the way um, markets are going, environmental trends, which could disrupt and change this industry? And we want to generally uh, avoid companies where we see structural change, a structural, structural challenge. But if we do Sometimes we, we will see a trend and we think, yes, there's a risk here, there's an issue here, but the shares are sufficiently cheap, they're sufficiently priced in for that particular issue, and we can get comfortable with it. So we, we don't always avoid it, but we spend a lot of our time debating and discussing those issues and trying to spot disruptive changes and where possible be on the positive side of that and companies that can, can benefit from that. So we have a number of companies in the portfolio that are benefiting from uh, the energy transition, for example. I, IG is a company that you could argue is benefiting to, from technological disruption and change. Um, the UK market isn't known for its diversity of tech companies. Do you think that's holding the market back? Is that something, I know most of your portfolio is located in the UK, is that something you'd like to see more of or you would be prepared to invest outside the UK to get a foothold in? Um, well, you're right. The UK doesn't have many pure tech companies, but I would argue a business like IG really is a technology company. Even a business like Next, which is you know you might see, see as a retailer, actually has a, a phenomenal online business and a platform to enable other brands to sell on their platform, and is, you know spends a huge amount of money every year on technology on uh, facilitating that platform. So there are there are plenty of companies in the UK that actually have really strong um technology and opportunities and, and one of our themes that we have a number of companies that benefit from these digital trends but you're right there aren't that many pure technology companies certainly not many large technology companies listed in the uk market um but but there also aren't that many very large technology companies that pay attractive dividend yields um so we don't really look abroad for technology companies we it's not an area that we have big investments in but, uh, but if, we, if we do find companies that have strong technology, but trading at attractive valuations um, and, and in our universe, then we would consider them, absolutely. Okay, uh, so then keeping on the theme maybe of growth and technology, and uh, what's your view on income equities, value equities in a rising interest rate environment? There's a certain amount of research that says 
value does well in a rising interest rate, high inflation environment. But on the other hand, inflation uh, with with interest rates of the Bank of England going up, these stocks are going to become might become less appealing for investors. What's your framework there? How are you looking at the current market market today? I mean, we try not to be too dependent or think of too much about these macro calls about the interest rate environment, whether that's going to make a big difference. I, I think what I would say on this is that for about a decade after, you know, the, until recently, when interest rates were virtually zero, often low interest rates were being used in it as a, as a reason to explain the high valuation of high growth companies, where a lot of the, a lot of the value is coming in the, well into the future. They may not be making high profits today, but they're expected to grow fast in the future. And because interest rates are so low, the discount rate so low, the, the present value of those future income streams um, is higher. As interest rates go up, in theory, the present value of those future income streams is lower and therefore growth, growth, high growth companies have more of a hurdle compared to more value companies, which tend to generate more cash t t today. So I think there is an argument as interest rates go up that should favor more value oriented companies, companies generating a lot of cash today over those that generate cash in the long term future. But it's, it's not something that we you know, depend upon. We're trying to buy fundamentally good companies when they're trading well below what we think they're really worth. And if we get that right, we've shown that we can actually deliver good returns in different environments. We've, we've delivered very good returns over the last decade, which has been a very difficult time for traditional value investors. And I suppose what we've been good at is avoiding the value traps, avoiding the companies that might look cheap, but are cheap for a reason and finding the genuinely good businesses that are underpriced. And that really, I guess that came through last year with the market beating performance that the trust managed to achieve. Um, yeah, last year we had a bit of a following wind as well as a value investor. Last year was quite a good year for value because sectors like oil and gas, like defence, um, which and banking, which were traditionally areas where there were a lot of value investments, performed quite well as as interest rates shot up, as uh, commodity prices went up after the invasion of Ukraine by by Russia. So um, last year there was a following wind for value strategies, but that wasn't true for the previous few years. How about uh, banks then from the current view? You mentioned them briefly there. You said there was a bit of a tailwind on, on banks but with interest rates going up. They should, banks should benefit. On the other side of the equation, we've seen what happens, what can happen when things start breaking after 15 years or 12, nearly 20 years of near zero interest rates. What's your view on UK, UK banks uh, from both from a value and an income perspective? Mm. I think the it's worth taking a, a big picture view here that we had post the financial crisis, the banking industry has become much more heavily regulated, much tighter regulation. Banks have inc much stronger balance sheets than they had before, much more capital. Um, and you've seen the industry become much more orderly, actually, uh, much more of an, uh, you've seen, you've seen uh, I think it's more resilient than it was before. So bad debts are actually very low. In the, in the main banks um, and capital and liquidity is strong. Um, so I think the banking industry, and the industry is very profitable and making quite good returns now. So really for the first time since the financial crisis, banks have started generating significant amounts of free cash, um, which is then surplus to requirements and they can start distributing that and dividends from banks are, are growing again quite rapidly and they're paying out a lot of cash. So as pure sort of financial investments, they are generating good returns and paying um, high dividend incomes to, to shareholders. So I think that's interesting. Clearly there is a risk as interest rates go up. On the one hand, they benefit, as you say, from higher mar the spread they can make on the margin they can make uh, between what they pay out to, to um, depositors and what they charge to lenders that goes up. Uh, on the other hand, as rates go up too much, it causes more stress in the economy and, and the risk is that bad debts pick up because people can't make their interest payments or companies uh, lose money and you know, shed, uh, companies get into trouble and can't make their debt repayments. So there is a balance. At the moment, I think interest rates are not extreme in any measure, but on a long-term basis, they, they, are, they are a level that I think the economy can cope with and banks look quite well set. But if interest rates were to go up significantly from here, there could be further pressures. So always with banks, you have to think about 
the, the risk of things going wrong because they are very levered businesses, but they do look very strong now. And it's a highly consolidated industry in the UK. The big banks have strong market positions and it's quite hard to break into that. So we think it's we think it's an attractive industry. We have some positions in the banks, but it's not not one of our strongest views in the portfolio. So you you like them, but you don't like them that much. <laughs> uh, we like them, but there's plenty of other areas where we have equally strong confidence, if not more, and actually stronger long term growth growth prospects. Should we say? Yes. Okay, that does make sense. Um, so, do you think? <sighs> I'm, maybe this goes back to what we were talking about before. Is now a good time to be a value investor in the UK? I think it's a great time. You've got this unusual combination of a, a cheap market, uh, cheap compared to history, cheap compared to other markets, and a highly polarised uh, market, mar market where the spread in valuations is as wide as we've seen it in 40 or 50 years. And that means that there's a lot of mispricings in the market. You just have to talk about you talk about what's in the media about the problems in the UK, um, the money that's been going out of the UK, and that's left a lot of shares languishing at really attractive valuations. And that means as a stock picker, there are plenty of opportunities to buy genuinely really strong businesses at attractive prices. And, and that's not being lost on companies or private equity. You're seeing a number of takeover bids, um, and I think we'll see more of those. So I think it's a great environment for stock pickers, actually. Yeah, really, really interesting. Do you do you think the um, valuations are more depressed in domestic focused companies in particular than more internationally focused big blue chips? Generally, they are. I would say it's it's also more of a size thing. So small and mid caps tend to be more depressed than large caps. Large companies tend to attract people who will look around the world in a sector, pharmaceuticals, banks, and they'll look at the large companies anywhere in the world and say, okay, the UK ones look cheap. We're going to, those anomalies tend to get ironed out. Not perfectly by any means. Energy is still very cheap. But in the smaller mid caps, often they, they're not really on the radar of, of international investors sometimes. And that can mean an anomaly. So it is true that domestics generally look cheaper than international stocks. But I think it's also true that mid and small companies look cheaper than, than uh, large companies. And, and many of those mid and small companies are actually very international businesses, companies that we've got several companies in the small and mid cap area that make the majority of their profits come from North America. So they're not, in many ways, they're not really domestic companies at all. Do you think there's, there's a misunderstanding there among domestic UK investors about these businesses? I don't think there's a misunderstanding from domestic UK investors. I think there's a, I think, the problem for domestic UK investors is they've a lot of them have had outflows in their funds and they've had to sell, um, and they've been the natural owners of many of these stocks. And the the new owners either need something exceptional to catch their attention, and then some of the you know some of the best quality companies in the UK are actually trading on similar multiples to high quality companies elsewhere. Um, either they need something exceptional, or, or or the shares can languish and wait for somebody to come in and, and launch a takeover bid, or uh, you know, private equity come and snap them up. But I think, um, I don't think the domestic investors misunderstand that necessarily, but the, um, I think they're just, to some extent, um, there just aren't enough people trawling the market, looking for these opportunities. And, and I think that as a, as an investor, that's a great opportunity for us. Yeah. Are there any sectors you wouldn't touch outright just uh, sectors you would just avoid and not even look at even if they they drop to the lowest value rate you've ever seen um i think it's dangerous as an investor to, to say never because even within sectors that i might not like or I, I might think industries that have trouble there could be companies that have some interesting assets in that there could be companies that are transforming themselves um, often industries that make poor returns do go through consolidation periods and transform themselves because capital comes out of the industry and, and things can change. But I think there are certainly industries we don't like at the moment, but I wouldn't want to ever rule anything out completely. I think you, you should be open-minded in, in this industry and, and, uh, and look for things, things, situations can change and often the, the most hated sectors can be where the best opportunities are. Um, but there are certainly areas that we don't have large positions. How does that sort of overlay with your ESG screen? Um, we don't exclude many sectors on ESG criteria. There are, there are some, and so we, we, would, we, we wouldn't own companies that 
have a very large proportion of their earnings coming from coal production or energy generated from coal power. Um, we wouldn't own companies involved in controversial weapons. But in general, what we try to do is understand ESG risks and make sure that if there are big risks to do with environmental, social or governance issues, that we take them fully on, to, on board if we want to invest in companies and that we, um, we're well aware of this and we keep focus, coming back and focusing on those issues and engaging with companies on those issues to mitigate them and to try to improve the company's position in those areas. So we tend not, in this strategy, we tend not to exclude many areas, but we do, we do, we do spend a lot of time trying to understand those issues. So I, on, on just on that basis, I think it's probably worth touching on how ESG fits into your model with, with Shell and BP. Because I think, I mean, Shell's attracted a lot of negative attention recently for its, well, it's just attracted a lot of negative attention. But how, how do you sort of approach that, as an example, approach that company and say, look, this is how it fits in, this is how it doesn't? Um, well, there's, again, multifacets because there's lots of aspects of, of Shell's ESG, but if we just take the big one, the big energy transition question, we don't believe that divesting from energy companies or oil and gas companies is, is the right thing to do um, for the environment. I think if you look at the skills and the technology and the capabilities that companies like Shell and BP have, I think they are absolutely critical for the energy transition. If you want to take carbon out of the economy, you need people who can capture that carbon, who can pump it around and, and inject it into uh, underground storage, effectively into old oil and gas fields. Um, so decarbonisation, carbon capture and storage, the oil and gas companies are going to be front and centre of that. If you want people who can uh, produce hydrogen at scale, ship it around the country, uh, distribute it to fleets of trucks or to other to industrial users, again, the oil and gas companies have the, a lot of the skills for handling fluids, for handling gases, uh, high temperature, highly dangerous chemicals. They have the engineers, they have the, uh, the resources, they can trade these the commodities on international markets. So I think to try and deliver the energy transition without using the big oil and gas companies, I think would be incredibly difficult. I think there's a subsequent question about whether you need to keep drilling for oil and gas. And I think, I think for many years, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to have a lot of gas being produced because the first thing we want to do is get, reduce the amount of coal that's burned in the, in the, in the world and coal which is far higher emissions than gas. And if you can produce gas and reduce the coal production and coal, coal usage, I think that will help the environment. So it's a really highly complex issue. We could spend the whole hour discussing that alone. But we do think companies like Shell and BP are actually really important to delivering the energy transition. And they've each got their own decarbonisation strategies. They're each investing in, in other assets, other capabilities that over time are going to transform their businesses and make them more sustainable. So, uh, and the valuations are quite compelling in our view. So we think they're really interesting investments and we do think they are consistent with a uh, desire to decarbonize the world over, you know, by 2050 or, or whatever the objective is. Would you say that, that uh, the ESG, uh, your criteria there are, are pretty fluid and they do change? over time and, and have sort of have shifted over the past couple of years. Uh, can you just explain what you mean by that? Well, I mean, first of all, are they fluid as in if there's, there's more data to support certain things, would you then decide to change direction? And second of all, there has been a notable shift over the past, I would say, 24 months where there has been this realisation that gas will play an important role in the economy. We can't just cut it off overnight because we sort of tried that and it didn't really work. So would you say that your, your, your process has evolved during the past five years? Is it evolving? Is it constantly evolving? Are you willing to change if something I, I, Yeah, I think it is. I think it is evolving. I would say actually we've been saying for more than two years that gas is part of the future. And you know, Shell bought BG. Part of the reason was that for that to exposure to gas. And it's very clear that gas is a really important transition fuel to reduce coal production in the world. And, and you know, the tragic events of Ukraine and Ukraine have, have identified, you know, paid, put a focus on that. But I think anyone looking at the industry closely, looking at the world energy demand, unless they want to completely crash the world economy, realizes we need large sources of uh, fossil fuels, unfortunately, for the me medium term to deliver both, you know, there's an energy trilemma to deliver security of supply, reasonable cost of energy to people, 
and and a transition and, and you can't really do one without you can't really do one without the others so yeah i mean it will it will continue to evolve our understanding of the science will, will evolve our understanding of the role companies can play uh, will evolve um but i think we've been fairly consistent um in the place we see for the, the you know the big oil and gas companies um in the uk okay and so just moving on to something a bit more a bit more por- away from the portfolio here i just want to ask you some of what are some of your biggest lessons you've learned as a fund manager and the fund has learned over the past five years that have perhaps changed the strategy um well i think over over even longer than that i suppose what have i learned humility i mean it's 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 things however certain you think you are or however confident you are about something you can always be wrong in companies things can always go wrong sometimes I, some of these issues you haven't understood or, or missed sometimes external factors that come from outside or even a, a something within the business that was impossible to know about so i think you've got to as an investor you should try to diversify your risks um to you want to have sufficient diversification that if something unexpected goes wrong in a company or an industry um that you can still get through that and it doesn't have a a too big an impact but equally you want to be quite concentrated you want to have enough skin in the game you don't want to have 150 companies in the portfolio because it's not really going to matter too much you we want we've we've got relatively few good ideas and we want to make sure they they count but equally you know you want to um you want to make sure that no one investment idea is is you you don't have too much confidence in one idea i mean other things i've learned over time is that valuation is important but the quality of a business is also incredibly important and these structural changes that i talked about earlier these themes um can be very powerful over the long term so avoiding value traps as a value investor avoiding value traps companies that look cheap but intrinsic value is declining over time is is absolutely critical critical and so spending a lot of our time trying to identify those value traps and continuing to challenge yourself and and um you know be open-minded one of the things we try to do in our team is we try to make sure that we are constantly challenged by other colleagues who might have a different mindset and more of a growth mindset um and actually we try and find the external analysts or commentators who have a different view and understand those contra views to make sure that we are better informed and if we can't refute a negative view then we'll take that into account in our investment um consideration so there's plenty of plenty of things to to learn and keep learning in this industry um it's fascinating that's that's very helpful and you'd say the main the main takeaway there is to keep learning and keep challenging your ideas absolutely um you know what was true about a business three years ago may not be true today yeah well so on that basis then what was what has been your biggest mistake as a fund manager (laughs) What, is it a, is it a value trap or is it jumping into a growth stock that didn't grow enough? No, no. Def- well, as a value investor, it's definitely been a value trap. So I think <laughs> if, during the financial crisis, we had, or before the financial crisis, we had a large exposure to banks, particularly uh, mortgage and buy-to-let banks, um, and we built those positions up, or I built those positions up um, as they got cheaper going into the financial crisis. And although the credit quality of those banks proved to be all right, the buy-to-let mortgages didn't really default. The problem was the funding side, the wholesale, these banks were typically reliant on wholesale funding, which completely dried up in the financial crisis. And those banks clearly, as we know, got into a lot of trouble and had some of them had to be rescued by the by the state. So that was the biggest mistake. It was missing that part of the argument, is missing the the uh, the wholesale financing side of the business and 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 getting too confident on the credit side of it if you like or the the you know part part of the investment case and missing the other part so yeah that's that was the most painful uh lesson of my career probably and and you've come out of that learning to question your ideas and see the other side of the equation absolutely and also to realize that banking and financial businesses can be highly complex and where you've got a lot of leverage um you need to pay sufficient attention to that and um you know be be yeah be quite open-minded yeah i think that's all of my questions thank you very much thank you nice to see you great talking to you cheers thanks it's been a pleasure